And I'd also like to uh, introduce the, uh, uh, our public outreach committee who uh, uh, plans uh, these, out, uh, these milestones and, and does many other community activities for the State Bar. Um, and I'll, um, I'll start with uh, the chair, Jeff Paulson. And I'll, I'll read these other names and please stand when I do on the committee. Uh, Mike Ellis, Howard Gorwitz, uh, Bart O'Neill, Dan Chairbaum, and Lisa Walensky. And I also want to uh, introduce Charlie Rutherford, who's uh, uh, on our uh, State Bar Foundation, very active with the State Bar. Uh, also, we have uh, the Executive Director of the State Bar, Janet Welch. And is Lorraine Weber here, who is the Executive Director of the Detroit Metropolitan Bar, Metropolitan Bar Association. I think I've covered uh, uh, enough people and uh, uh, let, let's just talk about what we're doing today. A uh, pole town in eminent do domain is a much discussed topic and no matter where on the spectrum you stand, whether you were a displaced resident, business owner, or lawyer defending the actions of the government, each brings to this a singular perspective. The resolution of this issue was inevitably going to be controversial and contested. Now, 27 years have passed since the landmark Michigan Supreme Court decision expanding the power of eminent domain. Today, we'll revisit what happened in Pole Town. You'll hear a myriad of views. We have a distinguished list of speakers, a who's who in eminent domain law, and they will relate to you their thoughts and experiences regarding the 1981 Supreme Court decision and the repercussions that follow. At the conclusion of this program, a bronze plaque briefly outlining the issues will be unveiled. The plaque will later be permanently installed at Zussman Park at City Hall in Hamtramck. The State Bar's Public Outreach Committee has been placing these historical markers around the state for the past 22 years. They signify important legal landmarks in Michigan history. We call them Michigan Legal Milestones, and they represent both events and individuals that help shape our history and humanity. By the way, I do see Back there, another board of commissioner, uh, another commissioner, Greg Ulrich. If you stand for Our first speaker this morning uh, is Greg Kowalski. Uh, Mr. Kowalski is a lifelong resident of Hamtramck. He is also the chairman of the Hamtramck Historical Commission since its founding 10 years ago. At the time when the Dodge Main plant was demolished, and the GM Detroit Hamtramck Assembly Plant initiated, Mr. Kowalski was editor of the Hamtramck Citizen Newspaper and covered the progress of the project. He is the author of three books on Hamtramck. Hamtramck, Soul of a City, Hamtramck, The Driven City, and Hamtramck, The World War II Years. He is currently the editor of the Birmingham Eccentric Newspaper, so please welcome Greg Kowalski. Thank you and good morning. Uh, we're going to go back, way, way, way back to the origins of Pole Town. And that name, Pole Town itself, is synonymous with controversy. And it was that way long before General Motors even existed. The original Pole Town community uh, was established in the mid-1850s, roughly, when the first Polish immigrants, the first wave of Polish immigrants, came to Detroit's east side and settled in the St. Aubin Canfield area. Um, that area grew to be an um, industrious little neighborhood. 
uh, with a lot of uh, immigrants coming to settle there and immediately starting to build churches and stores and businesses. And um, that area originally was part of Hamtramck, but Hamtramck Township, and long before this time period, it had been absorbed by the city of Detroit. And uh, Hamtramck itself, Hamtramck proper that we know today, the city of Hamtramck and even the village of Hamtramck, never really was part of what we call Pole Town or what they call Pole Town. The Pole Town neighborhood had undefined borders and it really centered, uh, again, on that St. Albany Canfield area and stretched about to the uh, Grand Boulevard, which at that point was pretty much the border of Detroit. But when we have the stage set of the Polish immigrants moving in there, and the first thing they did was establish churches, and one of the first churches they established was St. Albertus Church. Now, the Poles had a feeling, and it was said of them, that they would not build a home unless they could see a church steeple out the window. And that's because they had this great tie to the old country religion that they brought with them when they came to uh, settle in this area. And naturally, they had a very strong connection to the church, and the church at that point, too, was much more than what we view even as churches today. At that point, churches were centers of the community. They were the home of a variety of organizations that people belonged to. They would come there for social events and recreation as well as for worship. So the people of the communities took their churches very seriously. They had a great deal invested in it, and often they invested their money in it, into it. They mortgaged their homes to pay for those churches. The original St. Albertus Church was a fairly modest church, but by 1882, a new pastor had been appointed, and his name was Father Dominic Kolosinski. He was a very flamboyant man. He had a reputation in Poland for being flamboyant, and even you know, he, well, he had some relationships with some female parishioners that caused some concern to the uh, church back there. But he came to Paul Town, and he was not bothered by gossip, and he knew how to relate to the community. So he uh, almost immediately began a program to build a new magnificent church. And he did. It's called St. Albertus Church. It's there to this day. It stands at the corner of St. Albert and Canfield. And uh, it's, it is, there's a, fortunately a group restoring that church right now and hopefully uh, making it more accessible to the public. But in those days, it was a very, it was very accessible, accessible and uh, very much a cornerstone of the community. And going back to what I said about the church being such an uh, important place, it was also a center of, of the local politics, which is where the controversy first erupted, because a group of parishioners who did not like Father Kolosinski's ways and what he was doing, and his, uh, his you know, personality split off from him, and they started raising concerns with the archdiocese over the financing of St. Albertus Church. Father Kolosinski would not answer requests from the archdiocese to look at the books, and when the archdiocese sent people to to actually come and investigate what was being done with the money. He really didn't even let them look at the books and turned them away, promised to let them see it, and never did fulfill the promise. This led to increasing antagonism, and it actually led to a split of the, the church community. And when the archdiocese ordered Father Kolosinski out and brought in a new priest, the, arch, the, the parish split pretty pretty evenly, pretty and pretty emotionally. So much so that it got to the point where some of the supporters of Father Kolosinski and some of his detractors were getting into physical altercations. They were blocking the priest from going into the church. They were fighting on the church steps. And of course, this attracted a lot of media attention at that time, just as these kind of things that would do today. So the, the reporters from the Detroit News and the Detroit Free Press and the other newspapers that were in existence at that time started coming down there to cover the controversy. And they were the ones who started calling this Pole Town, and uh, actually also Polak Town, or the Pola, Polish Quarter as well. And they did a lot of reporting on this. It was very lurid, very emotional. Eventually, um, Father Kolosinski was moved from the, removed from the church entirely and sent to, I think it was South Dakota, but he came back. He established Sweetest Heart of Mary Church in defiance of the Archdiocese, Sweetest Heart of Mary, which is two, just a couple of blocks from St. Albertus, and again, still standing, still there, and another magnificent church in its own right. Um, this, you know, this controversy went on for several years until finally uh, Dick Father Kolosinski and the Archdiocese did reconcile and they got back together. And um, 
Uh, Father Koloszynski eventually, uh, well, 10 years later, he died and was buried uh, not far from here. Um, even after that period, though, when things started calming down in the 1890s, and at this point, we're going to the 1890s to 1900, about 48,000 people lived in that particular area. And again, it was centered on the St. Alban Canfield, south of the boulevard, around to Harper, and uh, that's, uh, that whole community out there. Um, the, uh, Father Kol uh, after Father Koloszynski was uh, removed from the church, came back, everything calmed down, and then another controversy erupted in around 1893, and this was involving Polish workers who were working on a project over there called the Connors Creek Excavation. The bosses of the project decided to um, change the wage scale and uh, change how they worked and how they were paid for the work that they did. This caused, again, more controversy, more violence. In fact, in the earlier violence, one of Father Koloszynski's uh, detractors was actually shot and killed. Uh, in a nearby building, which of course caused an enormous uproar. And again, in 1893, when this labor dispute occurred, another worker was shot and killed. And again, more controversy, more publicity. So Poltown kind of established quite a reputation of its own and throughout this whole period. <clears throat> Later on, as we moved into the early 20th century, the uh, Poltown started to be challenged by Hamtramck for the crown of what is the Polish community. Hamtramck started with 3,500 people in 1910, and in 1920 it had 48,000 people. And it was because of Dodge Main opening and attracting all of these Polish workers who came to Hamtramck to work. So the Polish community kind of shifted from what we traditionally know as Pole Town up into the Hamtramck area. And through the early years of the 20th century, it was still, Pole Town itself was still a viable community. After World War II, it kind of suffered the fate that a lot of so, in, inner city uh, communities suffered, inner city neighborhoods suffered. Soldiers came home from the war. They wanted better houses. They wanted more space. So they started moving to the suburbs. And that led to the eventual decline of the community. Uh, and that it was uh, after the riot of 1967 that was increased even more. So the community itself went into a long period of decline. Um, in 1973, there was an effort to kind of revitalize the community down there with, the, with Shane Ferry Market, using that as a focal point, and it was renovated, and buildings were painted, and new signs were put up. But by then, there had been just too much, uh, too much flight, too much damage, too much crime. So that effort, within a few years, just faded away. And you, it's kind of sad if you even go down there these days, because you can still see the remnants of it. So Pole Town kind of just deteriorated, and uh, there were, and to this day, there still remains some Polish people who live there, and um, there was vestiges, and still are vestiges of the old Pole Town community as well, too. You can see St. Hyacinth Church, which is also in that area, just a few blocks over from there, too, and St. Stanislaus Church was over there, but that eventually closed as well. So after World War II and going into the present, or up to the, uh, to the 1980 or 1979, 1980, when, when Dodge Main closed and the Pole Town plant was proposed, the community itself had gone into a great state of decline. Um, when the General Motors project was proposed, um, there were about 4,800 people living in that specific area that the plant eventually came to cover. And of course, we know, know what the controversy that erupted to. Um, but you can see it was a historic area. It still is a historic area. And you can go and visit the church at St. Albertus, which I would recommend that you do. It is open on occasion. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, that Father Koloszynski, who was so much a part of establishing the Poltown community, is actually buried very near here. He's over in sweetest, or Sacred Heart of St. Mary's Cemetery, which is over on Mound Road at Davison. And his mausoleum is still there, very near the corner. And every day, thousands of people pass by it without even realizing that this historical figure who had so much to do with this historical neighborhood is buried there. So if you ever get a chance to do that, take a ride by there and see the amazing amount of history that we have from Pole Town to Hamtramck to this neighborhood just north of us as well. So that gives you kind of an overview of how Pole Town came to be early, early on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerome Pesek, 
Uh, he is a managing shareholder of Steinhardt, Pesic, and Cohen uh, in Birmingham. I've known Jerry Pesic for uh, many years. He is a terrific lawyer and an expert in condemnation law. He was recently lead counsel on behalf of the property owners in the largest eminent domain verdict in Michigan history. Uh, the original government offer was $13.7 million for a 6.3 acre piece of property on the Detroit River. The verdict rendered was $25 million. Mr. Pesic has represented clients in major condemnation projects in Michigan for almost three decades, including Pole Town, a Detroit Waterfront Casino and Reclamation Project, Comerica Park, Ford Field, and numerous others. He has served in many leadership capacities in the State Bar's Real, uh, real uh, Property Law section and is the author of several uh, articles on eminent domain. He is also a frequent speaker and lecturer at state and national conferences on eminent domain. Please welcome Jerry Pesic. Thank you, Ed. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here for the dedication of the legal milestone marking the Michigan Supreme Court's decision in the Pole Town case, and I'd like to thank the State Bar for organizing this event. Uh, I've been asked to try and give a brief overview of the evolution of the public use doctrine here in Michigan over the last hundred years in about five minutes. Um, it's kind of a formidable task, so let me try and get to it. Everyone knows that Pole Town was the case that allowed the city of Detroit to take an entire neighborhood so that GM could build a new assembly plant. But not everyone realizes that before Pole Town was even decided, both state and federal courts, both state and federal courts had been making decisions that would, had been watering down the public use limitation for decades. Traditionally, public uses for purposes of eminent domain were just that, municipal buildings, parks, schools, uses that were available to the public at large. That started to change in the early part of the 20th century when the courts began approving takings to help establish uh, the milling and railroad industries by way of example. And by the middle of the 20th century, however, public uses for which property could be taken by eminent domain had expanded even further. The best example of direction things were going in by the middle of the 20th century was, a, was in a case called Burmas, Berman, versus, Berman versus Parker. It was a 1954 United States Supreme Court case. In that case, the court permitted a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. to be taken and in part sold off to new private owners because it was allegedly, it was allegedly blighted. That was notwithstanding the fact that a department store which challenged the taking of its property was actually quite a successful operation. Regardless of the fact that there were successful operations in this allegedly blighted neighborhood, the court held that the concept of public welfare was broad and inclusive enough to permit the taking of the neighborhood in that case. And in doing so, the court began to equate the public use limitation to a much broader concept of public welfare or public purpose. The Michigan Supreme Court in the Pohl Town case took the next big step, taking virtually an entire neighborhood here in Hamtramck and in Detroit to build a GM plant. And relying on the Berman versus Parker case, the Michigan Supreme Court explicitly held that the Constitution's public use provision was synonymous with, a public, with its public purpose provision. Under that analysis, effectively, any time the government wanted to do something that it believed promoted a public purpose like by way of example, promoting economic development, it could take property to do so. And governmental agencies after the Pole Town decision were not shy about doing just that. After the Pole Town decision, another area in Detroit that I'm sure many of you are familiar with along East Jefferson was taken to expand, expand a Chrysler plant. In fact, governments sought to use the power of eminent domain for all kinds of things that they thought were public purposes, from a proposed theater district to automobile dealership expansions to basic redevelopments that would wipe out longtime homeowners and businesses. That approach finally came to an end here in Michigan in 2004 with the Wayne County versus Hathcock case. When Wayne County sought to take a broad area of land south of Metropolitan Airport for airport related economic development, the Michigan Supreme Court reestablished the public use limitation that had been eroding over the last half decade. It reasserted that under the Michigan Constitution, property cannot be taken for transfer from one property owner to another to, 
promote economic development, explaining there was no historical basis in Michigan law for the Poletown Court's decision in the first place. Looking back at Poletown, I think we have to view that decision in the context of its time. Unemployment in Michigan was over 14 percent, and within the city of Detroit it was closer to 20 percent. Chrysler had just been stabilized with a $1.5 billion loan guarantee from the federal government, and Ford, GM, and American Motors, which is still around at the time, were all reporting huge, huge losses. In an effort to change direction, GM was going to build a new plant, and GM was agreeable to building that plant in Detroit and Hamtramck if the city could come up with the land. The Pole Town decision made it possible for the city to come up with the land and facilitate the construction of GM's plant. Now, you might be saying to yourselves that the economic circumstances surrounding the court's decision in Pole Town don't sound all that different from the circumstances that we hear about in the news today. But Michigan law is different today. Michigan law no longer allows property to be taken from its owners for transfer to another owner for an economic development project. And Hathcock made clear that such takings are unconstitutional in Michigan. Now, to be sure, there are other views of the Constitution out there besides that which the Michigan Supreme Court put forward in, in the Hathcock case. And the best example is the U.S. Supreme Court's decision a year later in 2005 in a case called Kelo versus City of New London, which got a great deal of publicity in the press. In that case, the court permitted a Connecticut city to take many properties, including a number of nice residences, for an economic development project that evolved, involved, among other things, new offices, retail, and residential components. But that type of situation can no longer happen in Michigan under the current status of the law here. Not only does the Hathcock case hold that such takings are not for public use, but in the wake of Kelo, the people of the state of Michigan amended our Constitution to make clear that public use does not include the taking of private property for transfer to a, property, to a private entity for the purpose of economic development or enhancement of tax revenues. Likewise, the Michigan legislature has adopted and the governor has approved amendments to our eminent domain statutes to ensure that eminent domain cannot be used to transfer property from one private owner to another. So even though the makeup of our courts may change, and economic circumstances may call for drastic measures, here in Michigan, the, the era of coal town is in the past. The milestone we're marking today is an important one, and one that I believe represents a closed chapter in Michigan law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Our next speaker, Alan Ackerman, is a partner with Ackerman, Ackerman, and Dinkowski in Bloomfield Hills. For over 25 years, he has exclusively represented property owners in eminent domain proceedings. Mr. Ackerman represented over half of the owners challenging the condemnation valuation proceedings in Pole Town, Cobo Hall, uh, and the Riverfront, as well as Chrysler Projects. Uh, Allen presented the appellate argument before the Michigan Supreme Court, which reversed the Pole Town precedent in Wayne County versus Hathcock. His partner, Darius Dinkowski, defended the owner at trial. Mr. Ackerman has written numerous articles for legal and other publications and was co-editor of Current Condemnation Law, Volume 2, with his partner, Mr. Dinkowski. I've known Alan Ackerman for many years as well, and he's also very active in charitable organizations, uh, uh, recently with the uh, Oakland Bar Foundation, uh, raising funds for a charitable organization. So please welcome Alan Ackerman to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my wife is here, and uh, her favorite statement is that English is my second language, mumbling is my first. <laughs> so with that comment, I have something very conservatively written. I know I was asked to speak about my personal feelings about Pole Town uh, as, because I was so active as a lawyer at that point in time. Uh, my thoughts are that there's some wonderful people still here, like Mrs. Anna Giannini, John's mother, my associate's mother, and, and uh, Joe Bashero, who was a wonderful man. And I, I have uh, very fond memories of working at 5.30 in the morning. Joe Bashero will tell you I used to see him at 6.30 after I was done swimming at the Y, which I called my country club. 
and uh, I, I think back personally, and it was a wonderful experience, but what I have is written, and there's a three cases that all of you should know about because I thought this was all lawyers, and that would be Polatown, Hathcock, which is the Michigan case, and Kalo, and I have some comments written about this. The trilogy of Polatown, Hathcock, and Kalo have illustrated the intricacies of our Republican, small r, Republican form of government, and the conflicts between the judiciary and the legislative branches, public use, commerce, and reserve power clauses of our U.S. Constitution, and the apportionment of powers between federal and state governments. The three landmark decisions illustrate the difficulty of conflicting interpretations of both the federal and state constitutions. Creating, because of the uh, recent federal uh, prohibition under the first, because of the federal prohibitions under the Fifth Amendment, which limits condemnations to public use only, one could easily think that clause ended the whole story and there was no other issue about whether government could take for a private end purpose. Creating further conflict is the 14th Amendment provision, which applies the standards of the Fifth Amendment to the, for, to the states uh, ever since the Civil War. The real question here is the issue of how do you construe the words public use? Uh, when, when this language remains so uncertain, apparently in so many minds. If not a federal constitutional issue, the states have the right to control takings under what's called the Reserve Powers Clause of the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, leaving those powers not given specifically to the federal government to be re returned to the states or the capital P people. Uh, the question is, is where do we come in as people when the states decided they wanted to take our property? The ultimate conflict is one between the strictly construing language of the public use to mean simply that, a purely, purely public use, and those comprising the Kalo Court majority, the U.S. Supreme Court majority, after Hathcock's reversal of Poetown, which held it was up for each state to make its own decision on how it wanted to make the uh, finding of public use. The Kalo Court effectively considered the states to be their own chemistry labs, each lab, each state to make its own decision on how they would define public use. Some states like Wisconsin specifically state in their state constitution, economic development is a police power. It's public safety, health, welfare, and economic development. We don't have that clause in Michigan. Early federal and Michigan cases consistently described the need for eminent domain when there's a general benefit to the community as a whole. The question then becomes, is, is this just a general benefit, the poll count condemnation? The attitudes historically was that the standard would be of one of an exigency, something that was demanded or needed by the public as a whole immediately, requiring it as an imperative for the government to act in such a fashion as to acquire property for the benefit of the community as a whole. This happened for, as described by Mr. Pesek for, well, for grist mills for water power and for like uses. Uh, a, restrictive a restrictive construction of public use would be counterintuitive to all of us if in a, because of our historical support of government aid and development of such things as toll roads, uh, utilities, and turnpikes. But every time you saw that kind of situation, you had a local governmental commission, whether it was a Michigan Public Service Commission or some like agency, Sometimes the counties for, for local turnpikes, believe it or not, up to 1912 when the 1911 Constitution was enacted. And in all those cases, these commissions regulated and controlled. In Poetown, there's no after control for General Motors and its utilization of the plant. There was a plan to have 6,000 employees, but no guarantee of it. What's distinct about Poetown from all the earlier cases the earlier condemnations when your government was buying to transfer to a third party, there's a clear blight. There's clear urban renewal. And Poletown was the first time where the government took a position of what I viewed as arrogance at the time was, this neighborhood's a nice neighborhood. It's a fine neighborhood, but for God's sakes, we're going to take it because it's, it's, uh, we need it for this use. And that's what the difference was in Poletown. A strict interpretation of public use under the Michigan Constitution as to a specific identifiable public need was this accepted standard before the landmark case of Poletown. Poletown ultimately instigated the all insidious growth of private to private takings. State Supreme Courts or appellate courts in 11 other states relied upon Poletown to allow these type of takings. An example is Kalo in Connecticut. 
Nationwide, the number of these stations for private purposes grew dramatically in the early part of this century, up to 2004, when Hathcock created the reversal of Polo Town. And my partner tried that case, Darius Tinkowski, whose family comes from this neighborhood. He, they tried it and uh, was uh, unsuccessful with the trial and appellate court level until they got to the state Supreme Court. And what happens is, is in this insidious world, this every mayor's cousin or best friend became a developer all of a sudden. People didn't know where the shovel was from the ground. So we have the Hathcock Court in, in, in 2004 slicing through the issue of whether there was a reasonable need under the statutory provision and f finding that instead that uh, taking a private property for a private use and economic enhancement for the community or for the government is simply not enough. The Wayne County Plan was not a public use contemplated by the Michigan Constitution. It must be emphasized, though, that Hathcock was the decision only in one state under one state's constitution. And this is what the Supreme Court ended up discussing later. And this is where all these powers, these constitutional reserve powers of the state come in. The importance of the Hathcock decision cannot be overstated because of the importance of it in reversing the terrible decision of Poletown and its terrible effects. A unanimous court ruled that the application of eminent domain for economic development is unconstitutional. And this court vote in, in agreement, Pole Town's economic benefit ra rationale would ultimately validate practically any exercise of the power of the eminent domain on behalf of any private entity. In retrospect, the federal courts have determined that a mayor not, may not des desire the type of taking that occurred in Pole Town by making that decision in Kalo. But what they really made it clear is each state had to make its own decision as to how they proceed in the future. Michigan has done that, as described, and by a constitutional amendment after Hathcock. So we don't have another Supreme Court deciding the other guys made a mistake. With what is now occurring in at least 10 of the other states, it would seem that the constitutional amendments are going to be made throughout the country, limiting these private to private takings. The notion that the control of property rights is for a state determination appears to follow a trend in the United States Supreme Court rulings of recent years that states should exercise control over real property actions within their own respective jurisdictions. Recent Supreme Court decisions have held that regulatory takings, those are inverse where government interferes. One would contemplate that the court has simply said that these property rights should be determined at the state level and not under the federal constitutional limitation on governmental infringements on private rights. All of this leaves one in a quandary of which doctrine will ultimately control here, the federalism of the division between whether the federal government has any right or has any control under its own constitution versus the state, whether if that, inevitably the federal government will get re-engaged, especially during a time that's such a serious recession as we have now, bordering, our, bordering on a depression, in which we won't have the federal government saying, Interstate commerce requires us to get down knowing we're going to transfer to third parties because it's, it's no longer a state decision. We have to get our national economy going. And whether we have a situation, whether the exigencies as described by courts so consistently are upon us again. In conclusion, you might think I would simply maintain Old Town was horrible and Hathcock was right. However, the exigencies which led us to Old Town and they were exigencies. Every major institution in the city, and you can reject them now, but every major institution from the political forces of both parties to the unions and management supported the poll down taking. I'm not saying it was right, but they did it. And whether we're going to be returning to those exigencies now, the reality of 1981 was that the Supreme Court held that it, the taking was a good taking and a public use because of the economic benefit. That we won't have to deal with again unless we change our state constitution. However, the ruling allowed private takings, which benefited too many of the politicians' cousins and friends, and all to the detriment of individual private property owners, whether they own businesses or homes, and to their detriment only. At the same time, Pole Town had its benefits and it created a lot of jobs, yet the rights were a one-time interference of personal affected rights of individuals, which will not happen again, hopefully. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Alan. Our next speaker, David Baker Lewis, is the chairman and CEO of Lewis and Monday in Detroit. He is also the chair of the firm's corporate services practice group. Mr. Lewis has over three decades of experience in all aspects of, mun of mun municipal finance law. He has a sterling reputation as one of the finest lawyers in the state of Michigan. He has served on numerous boards and civic organizations and is currently on the board of directors of the Kroger Company as well as H&R Block. Mr. Lewis represented the Detroit Economic Development Corporation in the Pole Town case. Please welcome David Lu Baker Lewis. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Ed. Um, and congratulations to the uh, State Bar and to the Committee on Legal Milestones. This is a great program. And I'm delighted to uh, participate in it today. Um, let me first disclaim being an expert in uh, eminent domain. There may have been a time I was an expert back in the 80s, but um, no longer. Um, and I, I think it's um, rather ironic, the selection of um, December the 2nd as a date for this uh, dedication in light of what's happening in the automobile industry and um, the hearings that will be held in Washington starting today about federal assistance uh, to the automobile industry, which is the lifeblood of, um, of the state of Michigan. Um, what I'm going to try to do is address the um, comments that um, were um, requested of me and the invitation to participate uh, today. And um, there are a lot of things that I, I think uh, my brothers here at the bar and sisters at the bar who are eminent domain law, uh, lawyers who are in the audience might debate about the uh, jurisprudence uh, represented in the Pole Town case and the Hathcock case. Unfortunately, time won't let us uh, get into all of those uh, specifics, but let me do my job and um, comment on the position of the Economic Development Corporation of the city in the Pole Town litigation. Uh, the reasons the Pole Town property was critical to economic developments of the city and how economic development in Pole Town, the city in general, uh, benefited um, with the, through the construction of the uh, plant. Uh, before I, I get into that, I want to comment um, just very briefly on how Lewis White Clay and Graves, as our firm was known then, became involved in litigation uh, and who was on our team. Uh, our firm was founded in 1972, in uh, November of that year. We were fortunate to have the opportunity to represent the city in the um, uh, Wayne State University, City of Detroit, um, Detroit Receiving Hospital, University Clinics project. That was our first public project. Uh, it was 1974 and um, was the year that the uh, Economic Development Corporation Act was uh, enacted in Lansing. We were selected to serve as special counsel to form the EDC under the EDC Act and were appointed as its general counsel. We worked in the early days of the, on the EDC on assisting businesses of all sizes to locate, expand, and develop in the city of Detroit with a dedicated group of professionals at the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. I don't see any member of the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation here. Is there anyone here from the DEGC? Okay. But the DEGC was a public-private development entity established by Mayor Young and representatives of the business community specifically to address economic growth and development in the city of Detroit. The experience of working on various projects under the new statute, the EDC statute, and to work with the provisions of the statute itself were the training ground uh, which prepared all of us on the city side to undertake the Pole Town project. Um, now, as been referred to, uh, Pole Town, um, as a misnomer, as um, Mr. Kowalski mentioned, um, evolved from um, the expected closure of the General Motors uh, Clark Street plant, which at the time was assembling Cadillac vehicles. Uh, Tom Murphy, who was then chairman and CEO of GM, um, identified the fact that uh, that plant would close and um, there was a possibility the plant would move out of state. There's a wonderful um, recounting of this uh, in the book uh, Hard Stuff, the, the autobiography of Coleman Young, so I recommend that to you. Um, 
Mr. Murphy threw down um, a challenge to the mayor um, that if he could assemble a site within the city that would um, permit GM to build a um, modern, efficient assembly facility um, that GM would consider locating there. And um, in the uh, materials over on our, uh, your right and my left, um, you can see uh, pictures of the, the old Dodge main facility, which is a multi-storied um, manufacturing assembly facility, which was not the business model of the automobile industry at that point in time. Um, as a result of uh, the challenge, the city of Detroit um, took on the, ch the uh, task of identifying a site where uh, a um, modern-day assembly facility could be constructed. And that turned out to be um, a site that was contiguous to the uh, Dodge Main facility. Um, and Dodge Main was closing in the early 80s. Uh, the loss of several thousand jobs in the tax base um, to the city of Hamtramck. Um, and that comprised 145 acres of the 465 acres that uh, ultimately was the uh, Pole Town project. So it didn't take uh, Mayor Long, Mr. Young Long to determine that uh, this was something that uh, he wanted to pursue and um, he spoke with uh, Mayor Kazarin and uh, based on the Dodge main footprint um, and the infrastructure around it, uh, there was an ideal offer to uh, GM for the siting of a, of a facility. But um, the public nature of the facility was uh, still a paramount purpose because the um, uh, preservation of jobs and tax base were critical to the city of Detroit, but even more critical to the city of uh, Hamtramck. So uh, why was the Pole Town area necessary for the project? Um, simply because the Dodge main area had grown to be the same kind of auto production area the city of Detroit was about to lose. And it offered a, um, um, a, an option among a number of different options that were studied for a new uh, facility to be located uh, by GM. The Pole Town plan was undertaken by the mayor and the city not because it was a brazen attempt to indiscriminately serve the interests of General Motors Corporation, but because the state legislature and its governor, William Milliken, had determined that such undertakings were necessary to preserve the health and welfare of the base economy of the city and indeed of the state. I should mention at this point that not only the EDC um, promoted the um, preservation of jobs and um, the alleviation of unemployment, but at the, um, at the time, a very critical statute in the overall mix was adopted. It's the Michigan Quick Take statute, which allowed condemnation to proceed uh, without the determination of fair value, which often was a um, uh, factor which led to long delays in condemnation proceedings. Um, without the existence of the Quick Take statute, the Pole Town Project, the Chrysler Jefferson Project, would not have been um, not have been possible. So accepting the challenge, um, the city of Detroit and the city of Hamtramck uh, began the project. Emmett Moten uh, was a, a development director of the city at the time. Jack Pryor at the EDC, Ron Flees, and many others at the Growth Corporation in the city and uh, city of Hamtramck uh, embarked upon this mission to fulfill the mandates of the EDC Act, a state law, to assure protection of the greater public interest as balanced by the state legislature and the specific provisions of the EDC Act. And of course included among these provisions was the authorization to exercise the power of eminent domain where necessary to serve the purposes of the Act. After the city and the EDC had undertaken the preparation of the requisite project plan required by the EDC Act and the city council of the city, the local legislative body, had granted the uh, power to use eminent domain in connection with the project. The Pole Town Neighborhood Council brought suit to declare that such an, uh, was an unconstitutional taking on the basis that uh, eminent domain in the, in the context of the Central Industrial Park Project or the General Motors Project 
amounted to taking a private property for, um, uh, for a private as opposed to a public use. So what was the position of the EDC in the litigation? Simply stated, the EDC position was that the project was authorized under provisions of the EDC Act and the Quick, quick, take, stack, uh, quick take Statute and the jurisprudence of the Michigan Supreme Court since the state legislature had found that the preparation, prevention, and alleviation of conditions of unemployment in the state itself was a public purpose. Um, the aggregation of private property for redevelopment uh, constitutes a public use. Uh, this was something that had appeared in the jurisprudence of the state uh, long before the Polk Town, Pol Town case was, was heard. I should drop a footnote here that um, the Lewis White Clay and Graves team, which litigated this case, was a very solid one. Eric L. Clay, at the time head of the litigation practice group of the firm, um, led the battle. He is now a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, Victoria Roberts, who's here with us today, at the time a partner in the firm and subsequently president of the State Bar of Michigan, was a senior member of the uh, litigation practice group of the firm. Victoria is now a judge of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. Reuben Mundy, uh, at the time a partner in the firm, as he is now, and a name partner now, subsequently uh, president of the firm and an active member of the State Bar Real Property Section, was head of our real estate practice group at the time. Then there was me. Um, and I did not really uh, have the same kind of litigation or real estate skills that my other colleagues did. The collective talent of our firm with our co-counsel in, in the litigation, Honigman, Miller, Swartz, and Cohn, tried the matter before Judge George Mountain and handled the appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court. I was asked to argue the, Michi the case in the Michigan Supreme Court, which I did. The Sup Michigan Supreme Court ruling in the Pole Town Craig case did extend the power of eminent domain to the area of job creation and economic development. Clearly, there's, there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, I believe the decision reaffirmed a long line of rulings which authorized the use of the sovereign power of eminent domain, inherent in the powers of sovereign governments, for a public purpose and a public use, even when private use is an incidental incident of the exercise. The Supreme Court ruling stayed, uh, stayed the same over the years as far as the jurisprudence is concerned. What had changed were the circumstances to which those rulings were being applied. Essential to the court's ruling in Pole Town was the premise that what constitutes a public purpose is a legislative determination subject to review in the courts for abuse of discretion, a premise which the Hathcock Court uh, rejected. The soundness of this pre premise is being demonstrated this year through the uh, federal legislation enacted by Congress in, to cope with the perilous times in the automobile industry. Uh, all sorts of public interventions are being, invented, uh, being mandated and authorized by Congress in a variety of different industries because a representative body, presumably reflecting the will of the people of the country, and in such a, um, it, it is in such a much better and defensible position for that body to declare what serves a public purpose and a public use, a role that the federal and state judiciary should honor in good times and bad. Now, finally, how did the economic development improve um, in the area due to uh, Pull Town? Uh, first, with respect to a retained uh, tax base, in 1987, several years after the project was completed, the uh, city of Detroit's official statistics reported that um, General Motors was the single largest taxpayer in the city of Detroit with $395 million of taxable property. Um, Chrysler Corporation in that year, and I'll get to the Jefferson uh, plant in a minute, um, was $121 million, the fourth largest taxpayer in the city. The total um, real and personal property tax base of the city at that, in 1987, was about $5.3 billion. So the $516 million of taxable property just for these two manufacturers represented about 10% of the city tax base. Um, what that 
figure would be taking into consideration other uh, aspects of or other components of the automobile industry, suppliers and others, is, is not hard, is, is not easy to um, suggest, but it would be something more than 10 percent. For the city of Hamtramck, um, it retained the, the tax base that it was um, to lose from the loss of um, the Dodge main closing. So the city of Hamtramck initially got $1.7 million and subsequently up to $7 million as a result of the existence of that plan. Uh, those dollars obviously being used for the benefit of the citizens of the city of Hamtramck. With respect to employment, in 1987, General Motors had uh, within the city of Detroit 36.5 thousand employees, the single largest employer in the city. Of course, all of those jobs were not at the Pole Town plant. Uh, Chrysler, in 1987, um, had 25,000, the second largest employer in the city. Um, the economic development that took place in Pole Town also led the way for the Chrysler Jefferson plant to um, be constructed later in the uh, 1980s. Um, and it is uh, obviously a facility that is contribu contributing to the welfare and the financial uh, uh, vitality of the city of Detroit at this point in time. One can only wonder what the um, city of Detroit's economic situation would be without these two facilities. Other impacts um, economically are not known because they're so difficult um, to estimate. Uh, auto suppliers, um, small businesses, those uh, spin-off uh, activities um, have not been quantified except to the extent that it is generally said for every automobile manufacturing job, um, six uh, other jobs are created. So uh, those are the things that were on the mind of the city of Detroit and the Economic Development Corporation at the time. And those um, issues sort of motivated and underlined the city's effort to um, bring the Coal Town project to completion. Thank you. Thank you, David. Norm Anchors is our next speaker, and he is chairman of the litigation department of Honigman, Miller, Schwartz, and Cohn in Detroit. He has practiced in the condemnation litigation arena since becoming a member of the Michigan Bar in 1979. The Pole Town litigation was his first major condemnation litigation work. I've also known uh, Norm for many years. I think I'm starting to know everybody because I've been practicing too long. But Norm is one of the uh, top uh, commercial trial lawyers in the state of Michigan. Uh, he teaches uh, trial advocacy in, at Ann Arbor's Institute of Continuing Legal Education and is an adjunct professor at the University of Detroit Mercy Law School where he teaches conflict of laws and evidence. Please welcome Norm Ankers. Thanks, Ed. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, I was, uh, along with several of my Hollywood colleagues, also special counsel to the city of Detroit in connection with the Pole Town litigation, which went up to the Supreme Court. Let me offer three quick perspectives on the case that may be a little bit different from what you've heard so far. The first perspective that I'm going to offer is a factual perspective which has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I am a commercial trial lawyer and a condemnation lawyer. I am, in fact, contrary to what my last name would suggest to most of you, a full-blooded Pole whose family has deep roots in the Polish community. In the late 1940s, when my late Polish father, Czesław Antkiewicz, was dating my Polish mother, she said, Chet, if we're going to have a future together, you're going to have to change your name to something which everybody can spell and understand. And of course, in those days, there was a lot of pressure to assimilate. Being the dutiful boyfriend that he was and wanting to have a future with my mom, he went to the Wayne County Probate Court, got his name changed to Chester Anchors, and for the next 60 plus years, people who don't know my family have been guessing about our ethnicity. Uh, but in fact, my roots are very, very Polish. My Late uh, maternal grandparents lived most of their adult lives on Hewitt and Hamtramck, a stone's throw 
from where we uh, are right now, they were proud parishioners at uh, St. Florian, where they lived long enough lives to celebrate their 75th wedding anniversary. My late uncle was on the city council of the city of Hamtramck in the 1940s. My mom was the salutatorian of Hamtramck High in 1943. And I grew up on the east side in a Polish enclave where I was probably in fourth grade before I knew that there was anybody in the universe who wasn't Polish and Catholic. <laughs> now, I mention that family history for a reason. Because we were steeped in things that are Polish, I know and knew something about the community. And I will tell you that my Polish family's perspective on the clamor over Pole Town was that the vibrant, active, ethnic community described by Greg Kowalski earlier today had long been, sadly, on the wane by the time that this condemnation took place in 1979. Our family's experience, called from our friends, some of whom lived in that neighborhood, was that most of the persons who were dislocated by this condemnation were delighted to receive condemnation benefits and just compensation and moved to other communities because this particular community that was displaced by the neighborhood, by the condemnation, had indeed lost its vibrancy as a neighborhood. I know that there is a contrary view here which is held by people of good faith, but my own factual view, called from growing up in the Polish community, was that if the city of Detroit had chosen to do so, it could have chosen to condemn the property under MCL 125.71 at SEC, which authorizes cities and other governmental units to adopt plans for the rehabilitation of blighted areas by the acquisition of real property and the disposal of real property in such areas. I'm not talking about the surrounding community which remained vibrant in the heart of Hamtramck, but this particular community, in my judgment, would have supported a condemnation under 125.71. So I disagree with Alan Ackerman's factual view with respect to that. Alan and I have disagreed about a lot of things over the past 30 years and will probably continue to do so forever, but we always do it with a smile on our faces. Um, and if you look at the definition of MCL 125.72, it makes clear that a blighted area doesn't have to mean that there is no vibrancy left in the neighborhood. The definition of blighted area says that a blighted area, and I'm quoting, may include any buildings or improvements not in themselves obsolescent. Close quote. Interestingly, Justice Young's opinion in Hathcock, citing the In Re Slum Clearance Act of 1951, made clear that if a condemning authority had proceeded under the blighted area statute upon a finding that the area was blighted, the Hathcock court might have reached the same decision on the facts that the Poletown case did two decades earlier. Of course, if the city had chosen to proceed under the Blighted Areas Act, there would have been a vigorous argument about whether the area in fact qualified as a blighted area, and proceeding under that statute might have been viewed as a gratuitous slap at the community for no good reason. The city had ample powers, as David mentioned, under the Economic Development Corporation Act, and it proceeded under those powers. Interestingly, in 1986, the Blighted Areas Statute was amended to expand even further the power of a municipality to declare an area to be blighted. Because in 1986, the statute was amended to say, and I quote, it is expressly recognized that blight is observable at different stages of severity, and that moderate blight, unremedied, creates a strong probability that severe blight will follow. Therefore, the conditions that constitute blight are to be broadly construed to permit a municipality to make an early identification of problems and to take early remedial action. A second perspective. <clears throat> we are, of course, today appropriately focused on the economic travails which face our country now. But if you take a time machine back to the late 1970s, we were in similar dire economic straits. You'll recall the prime rate was nudging up to 20%. Unemployment was extremely high. 
Unemployment was particularly high in the city of Detroit. And an often ignored portion of the poll town opinion was the Supreme Court's finding that the city presented, and I am quoting, substantial evidence of the severe economic conditions facing the residents of the city and state, close quote. And the Supreme Court's further finding that, and I am quoting, if the public benefit was not so clear and significant, we would hesitate to sanction approval of such a project, close quote. In other words, from my perspective, the Supreme Court's holding in the Poll Town case was very limited. It did not purport generally to say that private property could be taken for a private use so long as there was some identifiable public benefit as a result. Its holding was restricted to the facts of the case. Stated in another way, I'm not sure that Hathcock needed to purport to overrule Poll Town. All that Hathcock had to have said was that Poll Town was limited to its unique facts based upon what the Supreme Court found and that those facts had not been demonstrated in the case before it. One final observation. I am, by way of personal philosophy, like Justice Young, the author of the Hathcock decision, a constitutional constructionist. I am a big intent of the framers guy when it comes to constitutional law interpretation. And as those of you who have read the Hathcock case, which is most of you in this room know, Justice Young's analysis looked at what the term public use connoted in our jurisprudence at the time of the ratification of the Michigan Constitution in 1963 and said, looking at that snapshot picture, this is what public use means. And that is, as Justice Young concluded, the intention of the framers. But I ask this question for everybody to think about in this room. Was it in fact the intention of the framers of our Michigan Constitution that the term public use in the Constitution was to be interpreted statically? Was it the intention of the framers that in determining the meaning of public use, you were, as Justice Young suggests, to take a snapshot picture of what permitted public uses there had been in condemnation context as of the time of ratification in 1963? and that that snapshot was the template for each and every occasion in the future, forever, when you would look at the issue of public use? Or did the framers intend instead that the definition was supposed to evolve in response to changing conditions, so that if a condemning authority was faced with the kinds of extreme economic conditions like we face now, and may face in the uncertain future, a legislature, the people's elected representatives, might well again conclude, as the city of Detroit concluded some 30 years ago, that a transfer of private property to a private entity might be constitutionally justified if it served, promoted, and had its origin in a critical public use. To me, those are the great unanswered constitutional questions of the Hathcock case. And perhaps, God willing, at some time in the future, the wonderful lawyers that you and I have heard speak today, zealously representing clients of good faith with opposing views, will join issue before the court in the same spirited way that we all did back in 1980 to try to answer those difficult questions. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. If we had some time, I'd give Alan Ackerman three minutes rebuttal, but I'm <laughs> Uh, our final speaker is the Honorable Paul Peruk. Born and raised right here in the city of Hamtramck, Judge Peruk was elected to the 31st District Court in 1990 and is now completing his 18th year in office. He was appointed by Chief, uh, by Chief Judge, uh, appointed Chief Judge by the Michigan Supreme Court in 1991. Last month, Judge Peruk was elected to another six-year term. Judge Baruch has served in many capacities in various judges' associations, and he, he is a member, and he is a mentor for newly elected and appointed judges. He is also on the board of directors of the Detroit Metropolitan Bar Association, our partner in this milestone dedication. Please welcome one of Ham Tramick's very own, Judge Paul Peru.
Thank you, Ed, for those nice thoughts and comments. Um, I was asked today to speak about the impact of the Pole Town decision on, on the city of Hamtramck and the city of Detroit and the surrounding communities. Mr. Lewis spoke so eloquently about the economic, economic impact that was going on with the city of Detroit at the time, so I will not make any comments regarding the city of Detroit now. I will limit my comments to the economic impact that the decision had with the city of Hamtramck. Before I do that, though, I just want to tell everybody that I'm very thrilled to be here and participate in the State Bar of Michigan's 33rd Legal Dedication Ceremony. This milestone is an important event here, and this is my first time attending such an event. I'm very impressed by everything that's taken place so far and all of the important people that have come to Hamtramck to celebrate in this event. When I received the call from Jeff Paulson a number of months ago on behalf of the State Bar of Michigan, he told me that the uh, State Bar had chosen Pole Town an eminent domain um, for its legal milestone dedication ceremony and that they wanted the city of Hamtramck to host the event. There were a lot of motions that came to me. I remembered the Pole Town case and I remembered all of the anxiety with both sides. On both sides there was excitement and pride and honor but also on the other side there was heartache and sympathy and anxiety. But what the State Bar of Michigan is doing here is a very important thing. To have this case and this issue linked with former recipients such as Sojourner Truth, Augustus Woodward, Gerald Ford, to have these issues linked with civil rights and racial discrimination, public access to water, and unwarranted governmental intrusion into the people's lives is quite a legal statement. To have the, the cities of Hamtramck and Detroit remembered in legal history is really, really quite an honor. So I first of all would like to say thank you to Jeff, the chair of the Public Outreach Committee for the State Bar of Michigan, for his efforts in bringing this here today. I would also like to, to thank Nassim Stecker, and Nassim I think is, in the, oh, is sitting there by the column, um, she's the Media and Public Relations Director for the State Bar of Michigan. And both of them have been very, very good to work with in keeping me informed in terms of the ceremony itself, getting some thoughts and input in terms of where the ceremony should be hosted. They came into town and we had a nice little tour and they wanted to see exactly where this plaque that will be dedicated in a minute should be placed. We put a lot of time and effort into that, and at this point I would just like to give, have everybody give them a round of applause for all their efforts. Thank you. I also wouldn't mind to take this a minute here to recognize one other individual. Um, Nick Franchak. Nick, would you stand up for me for a minute? <laughs> we need, okay. Thank you, Nick. Nick is an attorney here in the city of Hamtramck. But Nick has a number of wonderful qualities and, um, that I would like to tell you about. First of all, Nick grew up in the Pole Town area in the city of Detroit. His father was a funeral home director and owner in the Pole Town area on the other side of I-94. As Greg Kowalski told you, the Pole Town area consisted of a larger area. Part of it was taken for the Pole Town plant and part of it remains today. And Nick and his parents were raised, born, grew up there. Nick has also been a, uh, an assistant attorney general, a special assistant attorney general for the state of Michigan for, I'm assuming, 40 years. And he has worked for the state of Michigan on behalf of condemna condemnation cases. And I think Nick also did some work on some of these cases here when uh, the properties were being taken. Nick also was a city council member in the city of Hamtramck. And so Nick brings a lot of experience and good value and good judgment to the city and its environment. And I would like to thank Nick for being here today. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> okay, so being a judge, I have to remain neutral in some of these things. So I guess I'm not here to tell you what the, if the decision was correctly or incorrectly decided. You've heard from various experts here today about their thoughts and their views and their opinions. And as they have both indicated, um, this has been a very emotional issue. But what has been the impact of this decision on the city of Hamtramck and the surrounding area? 
First of all, before I can actually get into that, let me tell you just a little bit about the city of Hamtramck. Hamtramck is a very small community. It's 2.2 square miles. It's a very proud community and a very ethnic community. It's had a very long, long history and a long history of many wonderful accomplishments. Hamtramck is proud of its culture and heritage. And because it's so small, I don't want it to be mistaken for not having that much importance. I'm going to mention a couple of names. Dr. Maurice Keyworth. Most of you outside or inside the room here today probably don't know that name. Dr. Keyworth was one of the Hamtramck school system's first superintendents of schools here. And what's interesting and what's great to tell you about him is he brought the idea of changing classes to the public school system in the United States. Dr. Keyworth was in the military and it was a thing called platooning where you would change and you would go to different instructors for different um, classes and different assignments and learning things. And he brought that with him from the military and he started that and it's believed that he was the first person in the United States to institute the changing of classes in public school. Another individual, Emil Konopinski, probably have never heard that name before. Emil, born and raised in the city of Hamtramck, graduated from Hamtramck High School, was poor, his family was poor, didn't really have any money to go to college. Very, very bright student at Hamtramck High School. The Hamtramck Rotary Club heard about Emil and uh, his brilliance. They funded a scholarship for him to attend the University of Michigan. And what's important about Emil is the fact that he is one of the five scientists that worked and created the atomic bomb. He reported directly to the President of the United States at that time. And so Hamtramck has a very proud history. We've won the 1959 Little League World, World Series the 1961 World Series for Pony Lake. There have been many presidents and popes that have come here to the city of Hamtramck. And why I tell you how important that is is because the economic impact of this decision would have devastated the city. Built in 1914 and, and designed by Albert Kahn, you could see over there on the side the, the Pole Town plant, or the, the Dodge Main plant, I guess I should say. In its heyday, it employed more than 40,000 people. Think about it, one plant employing 40,000 people. It was eight stories tall. Dodge and Chrysler paid millions of dollars into the city of Hamtramck for property taxes and income taxes. But then what happened is you've heard some of the previous speakers talk about the state of Michigan and the climate at that time, the economic climate at that time fell into trouble. By 1979, Dodge, Maine, accounted for one quarter of the tax revenues for the city of Hamtramck. And then all of a sudden, Chrysler announced it was closing Dodge, Maine. When Dodge, Maine closed, the entire city of Hamtramck was thrown into financial distress. The city lost one quarter of its revenue. The mayor at that time, Mayor Robert Kazarin, went to Washington, as the car companies are going to Washington today. He met with Jimmy Carter, and he tried to have the President of the United States help out and receive some assistance. The President was very gracious at the time, but could not offer any assistance to the city of Hamtramck. Governor Milliken was the governor at the time. He came to the city. He formed a task force. He attempted to help the town through the crisis. But there was really nothing else that he could do. The only real solution for the city of Hamtramck and to help out its financial distress was money. Nobody could offer that. The federal government couldn't offer it. The state government couldn't offer it. And nobody could offer it until GM and Pole Town. Now, even as the city stared into a bleak future and bankruptcy was seemingly inevitable, General Motors put forward a proposal to build a new factory straddling the Hamtramck-Detroit border. It would cover about 465 acres, 
with about 3 million feet of space and it would employ approximately 6,000 people. There were approximately 1,500 buildings in Detroit that would have had to have been demolished, but in Hamtramck there were just a smaller number of buildings that, have to, that had to be demolished in addition to Dodge, Maine. In the 70 years of existence, Dodge, Maine had grown to be one of the biggest and largest automobile plants in the United States and actually probably even the world. It encompassed 35 buildings that's how big Dodge Main was. 35 buildings, some of them eight stories tall. There was five million feet of space. It was on more than 100 acres of land. They actually had two assembly plants there, two, two assembly lines. It was the only plant in the United States that had two assembly lines. When Chrysler closed this massive plant in 1979, it left Hamtramck with probably perhaps the biggest white elephant it could ever have. Hamtramck had no hope of ever removing that. The cost of demolition of that building was $35 million. <coughs> Even if that building could have been cleared by the city of Hamtramck, what would we have done with that property? It would be vacant property in an old industrial site. It would sit at the edge of an old industrial community. The land was virtually unsuited for anything else but really factory. Mayor Bob Kazarin at that time basically said this is a very big project for the city of Detroit but for Hamtramck it's the whole ball game. And it was. The GM Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant which is now called Pole Town offered Hamtramck a financial lifeline that seemed unimaginable a few weeks before that. So Hamtramck, which had faced its worst financial crisis since it had been formed in 1796, it was now suddenly on the road to recovery. There were many protests against the plant in Detroit, and there were lawsuits filed to halt the construction. But Hamtramckians were almost solidly in favor of the project. And why not? There was virtually nothing for the city to lose in the deal except the riding hulk of Dodge, Maine, and everything to gain. As for the old Pole Town neighborhood, which was on the Detroit side of the border, it faced near extinction. But as been mentioned here earlier today by a number of speakers, that property had been in decline in the previous years. Most of the properties were owned by absentee landlords, and many of its residents were transients. Today, Pole Town, the Pole Town plan continues to infuse revenue into the city of Hamtramck as its biggest taxpayer and accounts for 25% of the revenues for the Hamtramck um, budget. The auto industry now is going through some tough times, but the Pole Town plant offers hope for the future. With the production of the new electric car, the, the GM Volt, and that's to be produced there. That means jobs, that means revenue, and it means another day for this very small but very proud city, the city of Hamtramck. State Bar President Ed Pappas, on behalf of the city officials and of the residents of the city of Hamtramck, thank you for the State Bar for coming here and choosing the Pole Town case in eminent domain as the 33rd Michigan legal milestone. It really is quite an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. I would now invite uh, the speakers to come uh, forward while we unveil the, uh, the plaque, if you would. I'm, I'm going to read, uh, it's a short, I'm going to read the words uh, in the uh, uh, plaque so everybody understands what's up here. It reads, uh, harsh economic conditions and the need to attract high paying manufacturing jobs to keep the automobile industry centered in the Motor City led the cities of Detroit and Hamtramck to join forces in 1980 to condemn a working class neighborhood known as Pole Town. Homes, businesses, churches, and a hospital were demolished to make room for a new plant to build Buick Oldsmobile and Cadillac automobiles. While most residents were willing to sell their homes and businesses, some were not. A small vocal group of protesters staged sit-ins and demonstrations that attracted national attention. 
they waged a public relations and legal battle against GM and the two cities, claiming that the government could not use its power of eminent domain to transfer property from individuals to private corporations. In a landmark 5-2 decision in March 1981, the Michigan Supreme Court rebuffed the challenge, allowing GM to build a state-of-the-art plant employing up to 6,000 workers. It was an important ruling with national ramifications that set a new legal standard expanding the power of eminent domain by allowing the definition of public use to include economic development. In 2004, the Michigan Supreme Court reversed its Pole Town decision, ruling that taking property for developing a business or technology park did not constitute a valid public use under the state's constitution. This uh, concludes the dedication portion, uh, and I thank everyone for being a part of this dedication. A special thank goes, thanks goes to the local community for welcoming us here. This is what we aspire to achieve when we dedicate these milestones, to join forces with communities and local bar associations to highlight a significant legal event that affected all of us. If you'd like to make a suggestion for a possible future legal milestone, please contact members of the Public Outreach Committee or its chairperson, Jeff Paulson. Thank you again, and please join us for lunch.